Myself, I have research background in developing games, more board games rather than digital games. And also obviously very interested in climate change. I've been studying it for uh, almost 30 years now. Um, so we, we just, uh, a colleague actually said, oh, this call is out, you two should go for it. And we thought, yep, we should go for it. So it was a, a small project happening um, between November, it started late, it should have started earlier, but the money came through really late. So it started between October, November uh, last year up to about March. Very short, fast project. And the aim was to produce a game as an output. The idea was how to engage young people into thinking about, learning about, and acting on climate change. That was the goal. So the call was for young people age range, you know, 12 to 21, I think it was roughly. And we obviously were quite free then to decide under that what we would like to do. And Simon has very good links with youth groups. And so he had a lot of ideas what he, how he wanted to do it and with whom he wanted to do it. And I had a very good idea that I think, oh, a game would be a really good output. At that time, we didn't know what kind of a game. We just knew it would have would relate to climate change. So this then, um, you just get at least an impression of what the output was. So the project was got, called Are You Game for Climate Action? It involved, we recruited 13 young people aged 14 to 18. So you can tell we had an ethics, obviously, um, has to go through the ethics committee, especially working with young people, how to do it properly. The, the students were, actually paid for the time because we also felt that community participants should not just be exploited but they were paid appropriately per hour um, obviously not in money in this case because this was complicated but they get got vouchers but just to make that clear because i think that's also often an issue where we just go into community we we take take tag and they don't really get very much back and they were all from Bolsal Heath, so they were going into a college there. They were living near Bolsal Heath or in Bolsal Heath. For those from Birmingham, you will know it's quite a diverse um, and in the deprivation sort of ranking, not terribly high up. So it is not doing very well, basically, on that spectrum. But it also is an area that is actually quite interesting and self organizing and community orientated. But it is classified as a deprived area. It's very close to the city center. It's not far away at all. And so we started working with them. And then the partners were also the GAP um, Art Center. So it's an arts-based community center in an old printing factory in Moseley. And we also worked with the um, British Architects Association, so in the professional body of the RTBI, which is the Royal Town Planning Institute. So because it was a built environment focused topic that we had to fit in with and climate change, we tried to make it quite a diverse, interesting mix between arts professional bodies, uh, researchers, um, and connections we had um, in terms of the Anthropocene studies. So it's people who try to do climate change education actually at the university level. So it was using all kinds of um, connections we had. So some background to it, so it came from nothing. So Simeon worked, he's Bulgarian um, by birth, and he still goes back and actually runs summer schools there every year. And what he found also educating uh, that secondary uh, school age children on climate resilience. So he had just done that. He's done it, I think now the fourth or fifth year in a row facilitating it and what quite often he found came up is that actually the the students themselves they came up with game ideas so here they look they use sort of the the snakes and ladders idea to communicate some of the the material and what it was all about was also when they prepared for the summer school beforehand and got a brief of what they had to sort of engage with they try and understand the sciences behind it but also express it in a more visual form to communicate and engage with it. Myself, I worked with Alistair Scott, who's now at Northumbria University, and we worked on a rural urban fringe project by accident. 
sort of ended up suggesting developing a board game for communication because we weren't allowed to bring a PowerPoint. It was just a conference where they said no PowerPoints at all. So we said, okay, we develop a board game. We developed one in about eight weeks, which was also quite interesting. So all the researchers in that project, it was a UK based project. We just came together and basically developed, you can see the, uh, the game board um, there in the bottom right. We basically tried to communicate our findings yeah, through playing a game. And then in the follow on knowledge exchange project, we developed actually a resource which is called Participology to use game making, community professional game making exercises um, for board games, could also be online theoretically, but we thought board games are actually good. Put the rationale in, the guidance and the resources to help community groups or professionals to go for that. So we, we use it as a process to engage people to have a safe space, to have difficult conversations and come up basically through that game making process to actually converse with each other, think about the issues and really deal with them. And because we found it was it's a, a game environment always puts you, it removes you a little bit from reality. So it makes you a bit, think a bit more creatively about solutions. And especially when you work professionals, they were also then pulled out of their normal way of only focusing on certain things. They were sort of, we found it really helped basically do that. So we thought, well, if it works with adults, it must definitely work with, with younger people, okay? They are still closer to the time when they were allowed to play and wanted to play. Um, another resource developed was for GCSE students. Um, with the Royal Town Planning Institute also on planning because they wanted to help sort of recruitment of planning and for students in class to understand what is planning about and we related that, that to the geography largely and some other related subject areas curriculum and we were actually also asked now to do the same for the game that we just developed, Climania, to also turn that into a school resource because as we just found out climate change is kind of on the curriculum, but not very well. So that's also interesting. So we had quite good successes using, in a way, that using games as a format. So how did we do that? We wanted to have the tool as an engage, engaging tool for young people. We wanted to have serious play because it helps you to engage with complex problems. There's no question climate change is not a straightforward thing. Uh, there's so many aspects and <clears throat> We also wanted the students not to cushion them and, and make everything very simple. We just really wanted them to engage with it. And then the other important thing was, of course, we always worked in a group. So it's always about 10 to 12 turning up. The onus was on them to really turn up and commit to seven two hour workshops. And that was all between uh, early November and December. So we sometimes held two workshops the same week, basically. Who, who contributed? It was academics, experts, it was online as well as in person, professionals basically from the RTPR and the Architecture Society came along. And then in, we also trained the students in carrying out some research themselves because we felt it was good for them to actually go and speak to their friends, speak to family, speak to people they know about the issues of climate change and how, what they knew about it and what they felt was important so that they actually were equipped and be able to observe as well as do interviews and we gave them you know material produced by uh, quite a few um, renowned um, organizations in terms of climate change and retrofit education for professionals as well as anybody so here you see two exercises so in the first workshop we asked them three questions what worries you about climate change and why how climate change might affect your lifestyle and what would you like to find out about climate change. And then they also went off and we recorded it, we fed back. So they had to do some of the work, but we also in between sessions helped to summarize what they always came up with and took it a step further. But they also went home basically and asked exactly those questions to the people they knew. We also sent them round on a walk and say observe. And to be honest, Basil Heath, in terms of retrofit, wow. You know, you have single glazed windows, really poor maintained walls, you have a few trees, but there were a lot of issues, but they learned to actually look at it. It was it's quite an, um, a busy road there and stuff. So they were almost distracted by that. And they said, well, look at that house, look what it looks like. Because people just usually walk along the road like this, isn't it? Things. 
or chatting, or they are on the mobile phone. They don't actually look at it. So it was a really interesting exercise. And again, we just helped them. They did it on paper, and then we translated it onto uh, the next session so they could always see what they produced. Then we gone, went into prototyping and design brief. So it was quite fast. So we first fed them information, let them do research. Then they had to also play different games, think what they liked about different games, what they didn't. And then we had to sort of begin to really see, so what, what did they think was particularly important about climate change and what they were interested in. And it came out they really wanted to do something about retrofit. It sort of just caught their attention as part of what we told them about climate change. And then they also said, oh, it, you know, it had to be a bit like Monopoly, a bit of that. It had to be a bit of snakes and ladders. And it was amazing, actually. And uh, there's also sometimes, you know, you have to know when you're there and you have to know when they just should get on with it. So Simeon got an award. He was nominated for a Young Planner of the Year. And there was an award ceremony. I knew he was getting it because I was on the judging panel. Uh, so we weren't in that session. And it was just led by the Gap Art Center staff. And actually, in two hours, they produced a proper brief for the game. They had come up with a game uh, design, how they, what, what it should look like in terms of the board. They came up with the main ideas of what should be the different bits. And that's, they basically did that, uh, yeah, I think in three groups, they came up with that and they gave us this board to then work it up. And that's just, I think, fascinating in what a short spell with all these preparations, how that came together. And I think it was because it was 13, 15 brains working together for two hours. Yay! Um, this is what the final game looks like, as I said. So I, I won't explain it in, in great detail, but it is, it is time constrained because we race against time. So ideally half an hour plus extra, every extra player 10 minutes can be played between two and uh, six players. Uh, you have cards you have to answer in order to move forward about climate change. You have cards that you need to answer about retrofit to, to build up your retrofit house. So you choose a house um, and you've built up. And then basically you get some uh, wild cards, things that happen societally, either good or very bad or environmentally. And then, yes, you have sort of kind of uh, risk and disaster cards because things never go smoothly as we wanted. So we try to also have a bit of reality check. Uh, this is just one example of all these cards that we produced, and that's the houses that you could choose. We had six different house types, and then the retrofit, we, you just have to cut them up. So basically, they're all cut up into triangles, and then you have to build up five different parts to complete your retrofit. Hey, so. Key lessons. So what, what did we learn? In terms of, um, we actually didn't say it was a STEAM, STEAM project, but when we then stood back, we thought, wow, we actually applied all the things we know about STEAM and we, we had found useful. So all the STEAM principles actually that, that we sort of talked about earlier, they were pretty much all there. And I think it was just because Simeon is very used to design thinking. I was very used to design thinking by that time as well in STEAM. And it just ended up that way. And we thought, yay, that's actually really exciting. Um, we also did exercises. We just always came up with different ideas. But we did superpowers. And superpowers always came up also on Tuesday in one of the sessions, which is interesting. And it just made you feel reflect on what you're actually good at and something positive. Then also into agency, which means they were then bold to contribute uh, things and talk about it and actually empower themselves. Some were very shy. Some were more vocal. It was a very, I mean, literally 14 to 18 is an interesting age group. Um, but, and they were all very, very different from each other. Um, but it, they came together. Also Climania, you know, in, in terms of the name, they just voted it, came up with it, woof, there it was. Nothing better came up and everybody was happy. But it was a really good um, way of learning through experimenting and doing. There was obviously didactic, the session probably was the most boring one where we told them about climate change, but it was also important about that uh, content. But really moving away to a different way of learning and engaging. It was challenging, we didn't dumb it all down, but we also made it relate to their environment and to something that was relevant to them. Uh, we did provide very quick expert advice and they really appreciated it, but the experts sat with them at the table or they beamed them in remotely. 
And the interesting thing about the facil facilitation, sometimes we had to facilitate a bit more and sometimes we really just stepped back. And I think that combination was really, really important also to know when to be quiet. Um, we didn't oversimplify it, we gave them choice, we provided frameworks uh, to actually just speed it up also. We used existing materials as far as we could, for example, for developing the game. So it wouldn't take hours and hours and hours, but it was all free under the Commons license, what we could use. And yeah, we tried to make it useful and ap applicable. Um, so how could we, we, we wanted it to be inclusive. We wanted to increase the awareness of environmental concerns and we wanted to give them in a way some agency. Um, so we had an end goal. I think we said we have to produce a goal by week seven, and we did. And we tested the games as well with community participants uh, at the very end, uh, workshop seven, but also after, but we did that in addition. Um, yes, and I think there was no need to shy away from complicated issues. I think that's the other thing. We don't have to dumb down everything. We just have to make it accessible. And I think that's an important distinction. Um, so I think the tool can be used game, the, the process of game making can be used as an educational tool. So not just the output be used, but actually the whole process. And that should never be underestimated. And still the same, we found exactly the same with a professional context. When there's a difficult subject, don't just get them around the table, play something, make them think about it and develop it and have all these conversations. Uh, it's very important, very effective. Um, we used it in different community environmental climate change events. It was very popular. We were asked by a lot of community groups uh, locally as well as internationally to present it. And we also, I also used it in class, for example, to explain to students how to use participatory processes in a more creative way, but also link it to a subject area that is important like climate change. It can be used as an advocacy and engagement tool in community settings or organizations. Uh, it inspired also the development of another game. So another group said we want to do something similar, but they did a climate change governance game. Very complicated, but quite interesting. It's still being developed. So we inspired somebody else also to go through that process, which is quite nice. And we played it obviously in a lot of different settings with different community groups. Um, so it, it really facilitated discussion, reflections, and also led to um, Later on, also Balsall Heath, where we had it, they also formed now a retrofit um, community group to try and actually get people's houses really retrofitted. Um, but it was because there were also already many activists and professionals there to whom that game really gelled with and they are now running with it and also you can use it to drum up support to really go for it. It's also good for professional development. So discussing it with our Pro Vice-Chancellor in terms of using it actually for staff training to find out about retrofit and climate change. Just a fun way of doing it, isn't it? Um, yes, so it relates to STEAM because I think we, we sort of related it to the key principles. It is, it is com you, you communicate, you, it can be inclusive, diverse. And I think the, we didn't even think about it, but it was literally very fluid in terms of all the different sciences, knowledges, and uh, from sociology, cultural aspects to art, sciences, definitely. Well, climate change is very, I think, um, climate change mitigation and adaptation involves so many different um, subject areas. Um, so it was definitely integrative. Just to say, it's been, that's even a few weeks old now. It's been very popular, obviously largely downloaded in the UK, but internationally it's found traction, which is also interesting. And you can download, print, and play the game yourself if you want. Yay! I didn't have time to run over. I would have brought you know, one of the sets because we actually have 10 printed games. But I'm afraid I, I didn't have time in, in the break to run over, so I could, you could have seen it. But here we go.